Hey everybody, this is Mr. Bortnick for AP Calculus AB. We are in unit six, integration and accumulation of change. Today we're doing the chapter six mid-unit review. We're gonna focus on section 6.1 through 6.5. Enjoy today's notes. All right, welcome to the mid-unit six review on integration and accumulation of change. This is gonna cover lessons 6.1 through 6.5, but I'm gonna mention it will not cover 6.3 since I did not go over that uh, with my students this year. Uh, not an entirely important topic, uh, but probably something I'll go back to and make a video on in a future you know, time period. Uh, but for right now, we're going to just review those other sections. Uh, reminder that the reviews do not cover all the material from the lessons, will hopefully remind you of key points. Be prepared, uh, you, you must study all the packets from Unit 6. Uh, this jumps around quite a bit, so let's uh, get started. We're going to start number one with g of x, uh, which is an accumulation function of an integral from a to x of f of t dt, with the graph of f shown over here to the right, and a is a constant. Find the x values of g regarding each of the following conditions. Now again, um, we can, from our uh, information from 6.5, um, we should know that if you take the derivative of this uh, statement, and that's uh, using our fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, the FTC, uh, we can say that g prime of x, the derivative, is going to be equal to f of x, right? Because we're taking that x, we're plugging it in for our t here when we take the derivative of both sides of that equation. That also means that g double prime of x is going to equal f prime of x. I'm going to need this information uh, going forward for these problems, um, but that's something I want to highlight up front because they gave us the graph of f of t over here. So even though these are asking us questions about g of x, we can now answer questions about g of x using the f graph because we know that the derivative of g is f and the second derivative of g is f prime. All right, let's keep let's get it going. Uh, relative minimums. So where are there going to be relative minimums? Well, we know relative minimums occur uh, on g when g prime switches from negative to positive. So because g prime is f, we're looking for places where f of x changes from negative to positive. And so that looks like that's occurring at about right there, which looks like at about x equals 2.5 using this graph. We see that it's negative and then it's positive. So right there at about 2.5, that is where this is occurring. Relative maximums of g would be where the derivative of g, g prime, would be switching from positive to negative. So those are places where f of x would be switching from positive to negative. So places where f of x changes from positive to negative. Not a ton of room to write here, so I'm being very brief. But actually looking at this graph, there's nowhere where the function is above the x-axis and then switches to below. Uh, so there is none. There is no relative maximum uh, for g of x. For c, where is this concave up? Well, again, concavity is controlled by the second derivative of g. And so we place it, looking for places where g double prime is positive. Uh, but since we have an f function over here, that's going to be where f prime is positive. So we're looking for places where f prime of x is positive. Where is that positive? Well, f prime is the slope of this graph. And where does it have a positive slope? It looks like between x equals 0 and x equals 1, and from x equals 2 to x equals 4. That is where this function has a positive slope, from 0 to 2, nope, from 0 to 1, and from uh, 2 to 4. Where is this going to be concave down? Well, that's where the second derivative is negative. So that's going to be where f prime is negative. Um, and so f prime is negative. Where does this have a negative slope? Looks like only from x equals 4 to x equals 5. So from 4 to 5 would be our, uh, our interval where this g of x function would be concave down. Where is it increasing? Well, we know that's where the first derivative is, is positive. So we're looking for places where f of x is positive. So f of x is positive. Where is that? Well, that's if this is the f function, this is going to be anywhere where this graph is above the x-axis. So I'm looking at this part here. It's all above the x-axis, or the t-axis, I guess, in this case. Uh, so from about 2.5 all the way up to 5, it's above that. So looks like it's increasing from 2.5 up to 5. Where is it decreasing? Well, that's going to be where the first derivative is negative. So where f of x is negative, 
where is this thing below the x-axis? That looks like from x equals zero all the way up to 2.5. So from zero to 2.5. Where are there going to be points of inflection? Well, that's going to be places where the second derivative changes sign. So we're looking for places where then f prime of x changes sign. And we know that f prime, again, is the slope of this graph. Where do we see the graph changing, uh, the slope changing sign? We have a positive slope, a slope of 0, a positive slope, and then a negative slope. So at x equals 4, it looks like there would be a point of inflection since f prime changed sign there. And then finally for h, uh, given h of x is uh, some different accumulation function where they've got a function as the upper limit of integration, find the x value where h has a relative minimum. Uh, sure, let's take the derivative. So h prime by the uh, FTC, one of our variants of the FTC is going to be f of x over 4 plus 1 and then we need to multiply by the derivative of x over 4 plus 1 which would be 1 fourth and we're going to need to know where that's equal to 0 if we're going to be able to uh, find these critical values where, where that those minimum that minimum could occur so that's going to be uh, f of x over 4 plus 1 times 1 fourth has to be equal to 0. If we multiply by 4 on both sides, that means f of x over 4 plus 1 has to equal 0. And we know that on this graph, the minimum would occur when the x value, uh, rather when the, the, the graph changes from negative to positive. We said that that uh, before uh, appears to be at 2.5, right? That appears to be 2.5. So I want the input of this function to be 2.5. That means that uh, this x over 4 plus 1 has to equal the 2.5 if that's going to work. So we can subtract one from both sides. x over 4 is equal to 1.5. And if we multiply by 4 on both sides, that means that x is going to be equal to 6. Great. That's number 1. Number two, the graph below shows the rate of change of the number of people in line for a concert. This looks like a review from section 6.1. Um, how many people has the line gained or lost after five minutes? Well, so if this is a rate of change graph, we can uh, use that to find the, uh, we can accumulate that, that change by finding the area under the curve uh, between when the time starts at zero to, uh, they said five minutes. So I'm gonna draw a vertical line at five and we wanna find the area under the curve. Luckily for us, it looks like we can break this into some nice geometric shapes. If I draw a line going straight across here, it looks like I have a rectangle and a semicircle. So my rectangle looks like uh, that I've got, so I'll just say this is the first, this is the second. So the rectangle that I've got uh, looks like it's going to be five units across times two units uh, up. So base times height is five times two. And then our uh, second part here, we've got our semicircle. So that is gonna be, uh, looks like a radius of two. So one half times pi times two squared. So this is going to be 10 plus two pi. And they do want us to round or truncate to three decimal places. So we can plug that into our calculator, but this ends up being about uh, 16.283 and it's people. So that's weird that we have 0.283 people, but they did say round to three decimal places. So that uh, is what that would be. Um, so that is the number of people that would be that would be gained. They would be added to the line after five minutes. About 16, 17 more people showed up. How many people has the line gained or lost after 10 minutes? Round or truncate, truncate to three decimal places. Well, we've already found the part to five, right? We already found that part. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave this. This is the part up through five, 10 plus two pi. We already did that. But we're going all the way to 10 now. So we're going all the way to here. And we want to try to, uh, try to break this up into some more geometric shapes. I'm going to make this a rectangle. So we'll, we'll make this the third one that we, we find. We got the fourth one that we find. And then uh, the fifth one and then the sixth one that we find. So all of these little shapes from finding the area of them. I've already found one and two, right? That's the rectangle and the semicircle. The third one uh, that we've got right here is going to be... Uh, a three by two uh, rectangle, so three times two. And then we've got uh, a triangle up here, 
the fourth one, which looks like it has a base of three and a height of two. So that's going to be one half times three times two. Then we've got this rectangle or this triangle right here, which has a base of one and a height of two. And then we've got this triangle down here, which is it's below the x axis. So we need to be careful. We're going to actually subtract that area. So negative one half times a base of one and a height of two. So be careful. Um, in fact, I'm just going to erase that plus sign. Oops. All right, so if we do that, uh, we would need to you know, simplify and, and do this, uh, but this is gonna end up simplifying to be what? 10 plus two pi plus six plus three plus one minus one. So the ones cancel each other out, and so that's equal to 19 plus two pi, and that ends up being, uh, since they're asking us to round to three decimal places, uh, 25.283 people. So after that period of time, that's how many people uh, there would be in line after that 10 minutes. So what does that mean? Uh, after nine minutes, it looks like you know there's, there's a bunch of people and then in that 10th minute, between nine minutes and 10 minutes, uh, somebody left. So one, one person went away during that time. Maybe the line was too long or maybe they went inside or, or something like that, but the line suddenly got shorter from, from nine to 10, which is nice. All right, the graph shows which of the following. We see a Riemann's, we see some Riemann sums, some rectangles here. They're trying to find the interval from looks like x equals negative three to x equals two. And they're asking us, uh, you know, what do we see? Is it left, right, midpoint, trapezoids? Well, these are clearly rectangles, so it's not trapezoids, that's not gonna work. And so let's take a look at these rectangles themselves. If I zoom in, the question is what part of the rectangle is touching it? So for this rectangle right here, I see that the right side is touching it. For a second one, the right side is touching it. The third one, the right side is touching it. The fourth one, the right. The fifth, the right. These are all right rectangle uh, sums, right Riemann sums. So that's gonna be our answer uh, is B here for number three. Number four, use a left Riemann sum with four subintervals to approximate the integral based on the values in the table. So we're trying to find the integral from zero to 10 of f of x dx. Um, in this case, we are imagining uh, left Riemann sum, we'd have four rectangles. So I would have a rectangle going from zero to four, one from four to six, one from six to seven, and one from seven to 10. For my first rectangle that I've got going from zero to four, that's gonna be four units wide, times, if we look at the left, the since we're doing a left Riemann sum, we'll use the left endpoint of this interval, I'm gonna use three for that height. For our next interval from four to six, that is two units wide from four to six. And if we use the left, uh, the left side of this interval, that y value is two as well, so times two. Going from six to seven, that's one unit of width, and the height of that function is gonna be uh, the y value when x is six, so that is four. Finally, we're going from seven to 10, that's got a width of three, and then uh, we would then use the left, the left endpoint of that interval. The y value there at x equals seven is five. So this is gonna be 12 plus four plus another four, plus 15, um, that should be what, 35. So 35 would be our answer for uh, number four. Number five, use a trapezoidal approximation with four subintervals to approximate the area under f of x uh, is equal to this equation um, on the interval from negative three to zero. So the first question here is uh, if we're doing four subintervals and we've got this, um, this interval from negative three to zero, how, how wide would these need to be? So the width of our intervals is gonna be zero minus negative three, so zero minus negative three, all divided by our n, which is four. So that's gonna be three over four, which is 0 0.75. So if I'm thinking about the values of x that I'm gonna need, the values of x I'm gonna need are gonna be going from negative three then I need to add 0 0.75, so that's gonna be negative uh, 2.25. If I add 0 0.75, that's gonna be negative 1.5. If I add 0 0.75, then that's negative 0 0.75, and then we get to zero. 
So we notice that we've got one interval, two intervals, three intervals, four intervals, just like we asked. These are the X values that we would need uh, for our trapezoids. Um, so how do we set this up now that we've got this, got this going? Uh, using our sort of like factored form of this, the width, so one half is gonna be the, f the first piece um, because that's the from the area of a trapezoid. The width of this is 0 0.75. And then we start at negative three. We're gonna do two times F of negative 2.25 plus two times negative 1.5. Uh, I'm sorry, that's F of negative 1.5. plus two times f of negative 0 0.75 plus f of zero. So that would uh, be our, uh, you know, this would be the, the factored form of this trapezoid method uh, for this. Um, in this case, you know, since they gave me this equation, I would 100% at this point go to my calculator and I would plug in these values for this function. If you do that, um, I'll just sort of give, jump to the answer piece. If you do that, the answer should be about 29.320 uh, once we round to three digits after the decimal place. But again, I would take each of these x values here, plug them in for our f of x function, and then just substitute into this equation in order to get that. Um, I am skipping number six since this is on section 6.3 and we didn't talk about that uh, on this. We'll jump to our last two problems at uh, for seven and eight. So they're giving us f of x, and they're asking us to find f prime of x. Uh, here it looks like I've got a function as that upper limit of integration. So I'm going to be essentially applying the chain rule here with my fundamental theorem of calculus. So f prime of x is equal to this cosine of x becomes the input, so cosine of x quantity squared. But of course we need to multiply by the derivative of cosine of x, which is negative sine of x essentially applying that chain rule here. So altogether, this would be negative sine of x times cosine squared of x in that simplified form. Here in number eight, we've got two different functions. And so we're gonna be applying that, that uh, special variation where there's two different functions and we subtract between them. This looks like this is going to be two times eight minus x plus five times the derivative of eight minus x, which is negative one, uh, minus, we always put the minus between these two parts, uh, two times x squared plus five, we're plugging that x squared in for our t, and then the derivative of x squared is going to be two x. From there, we can try to simplify. This looks like this is gonna be, uh, what, 16 minus two x plus five times negative one minus 2x squared plus 5 times 2x. And so then that's going to be what? Uh, negative 21 plus 2x minus 4x squared minus 10x. So we've got a negative 4x squared. We've got a negative 8x and then minus 21. That would be our, oh, interesting <laughs> that we're getting this like sort of circle thing. Let's complete it. Um, and then let's actually be careful. Looks like I did 2x squared times 2x is 4x squared. This should be a 4x cubed. So let's fix that. Uh, but otherwise, that's it for number eight. Uh, that would be our derivative function for this. And I'll actually say that that's equal to capital F prime of x. Uh, nice. That's it for our mid-unit review. Uh, good luck studying for your mid-unit chapter six test. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stop by class or office hours, uh, and good luck. Have a great day.